In this video, I'm going to be showing you how I created this image from start to finish inside the Adobe Substance 3D Suite. So my challenge for this video was not just to make this inside the suite, but to actually use each one of the individual applications as a component in this to kind of give you all an understanding of how they all can work together to make some lovely final images. So at the end of this, you'll have the skills and the knowledge and everything necessary to make your own images like this. Uh, before I kick things off, I just want to reintroduce myself. My name is Michael Tanzillo. I am a 3D artist that's been working in this industry for over 15 years now. Most of that time was spent on animated films. I'm currently the head of a 3D artist team at uh, Adobe in the Substance 3D side. And I've also co-authored a book called Lighting for Animation. And I'm the co-founder of an online school called the Academy of Animated Art. So a little brief bio before I kick it off. So in order to get this final image, I didn't, I didn't start like this is the stager file. I didn't start with, with this in mind, been like knowing this is exactly what I wanted to do. I just had this notion. I love coffee. I love, I love coffee branding. And I kind of wanted to dive into that world a little bit more. So the way that I always begin my process is I always, always start with reference gathering. And for that, I'm just gonna jump into a non-Adobe product. This is called PureF. It's a really fantastic tool for gathering, collecting, and utilizing reference imagery that you find online or take yourself or in any source whatsoever. It just allows you to compile it, organize it. It's really great. Just look up PureF online. It's free, but throw those developers uh, some donation if you can. It's a very cool tool and I, I highly recommend it. Okay, so the thing that I was looking for that I knew that I wanted to build was this, again, like coffee branding. So I really kind of wanted to dig in and look at some existing ones that just, and I didn't really think about it, like, you know, Google searches, Pinterest, Behance, and I just kind of grabbed images that inspired me or things that I looked cool, that looked cool to me that um, I didn't really think about too much. I also grabbed some like cocktail images and, and, and things like that. And I just kind of started to put it all together. And what I realized is, is that all of these images, generally speaking, use a lot of water tones, a lot of uh, dark values to kind of give this feeling of like richness and lush, but warmth. And also just like, oh, the lighting of these is very specific. Like it's very centered on the either the bag or the glass or the cup. And there's just like a lot of dark values in it. So I knew I, knew I was gonna kind of build out something towards that. Um, I love some of the surrounding components. So I kind of looked into, uh, you know, doing, I wanted to create my own ceramic coffee cup for this. I just, I love ceramics in general. And I just kind of I like the different textures, colors, styles, variations you can get out of it. So I pulled a bunch of, of, of images together um, and just kind of, kind of allowed my brain to kind of resonate on that a little bit. And then finally, I just need, I knew I needed to come up with some branding or I, you know, something for this, this package as a whole. Again, I wanted to lean into this warmth kind of soft. So I, I kind of went with like a sunset surfing Hawaii, California vibe. And I went on Adobe stock and I just grabbed a bunch of images and I, I ultimately settled into some branding that centered around this, uh, these two sunset, uh, logos that I'm going to be kind of working with here. So with that in mind, I kind of like that really allows me to kind of get my head around what I'm, what I'm going to be building and what I'm really, really working for. So my next step in the process is I start to, to lay out the scene in, in 3d space. So I've got this, I know some people like to, to sketch and do things like that. For me, I, I like to just get my hands into, into the 3d space and kind of build out like a rough layout of that. So I'll jump to that now. So this is where I started with, this is kind of like my real rough layout of how this works. And so this, this is kind of my goal of what I'm building towards because it gives me an idea of where the location of all the props are, gives me an idea of the lighting, and it gives me an idea of the overall composition. And again, what I'm going to be kind of building before I start laying out the final materials and everything like that. So in order to get to this point, I'll kind of show you on a new scene, um, how I'm able to get there from, from start to finish. So we're just going to go to the file, uh, create a new scene here. All right, so in this new scene, I, I just kind of want to start building building that out a little bit. So the first thing I always do is I'll just click the plane um, and scale this up and just kind of throw down a ground plane. 
Now I know that I wanted to put my coffee bag in there, so I just searched in here for coffee. And I've got my little coffee bag. I'll just drag and drop that into the scene here. I know that I wanted to lay it on its side. So for that, I will just rotate it. Just rotate that. I, I'm, I'm holding down the shift key. And when I do, you can see that um, those numeric values pop up down there. And I know it's 90 degrees. It's currently penetrating underneath the surface. So I can use this lovely um, move to ground. That will go ahead and just slap it on the ground there. So I'll just go ahead and kind of rotate that around. Something like that. Uh, I know that I wanted this kind of overhead vantage point. So I'm just going to kind of keep that in mind as I'm, as I'm positioning these props out. So I know that I wanted to put a coffee cup in here. Again, I don't, I don't have that model yet because I want to create that myself inside of Substance Modeler. But for now, I'm just going to throw a cylinder in the scene as just a, a rough kind of a mock-up of, of where that cup is going to go. Just so I have like a, a little bit of a rough idea there. Um, from there, my other components that I want to bring in, I wanted to bring in like uh, 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 some coffee beans. Obviously, you see those in all the reference images, like sprinkled coffee beans everywhere, and uh, as well as some plants and some greenery into that. Um, for that, I actually tapped into the uh, Adobe Substance 3D Asset Library. So for those that don't know, this asset library is awesome. It's made by Substance artists so that um, the idea is that you can use any material, any model, any light rig that's been created here in your work. So again, this isn't a stock library where you have to worry about permissions and, 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 and agreements and whatever else. This is a straight up library. This is straight up for uh, consumer use. So for this one, I was, I started looking for just some like different components. Again, I wanted, um, I wanted some, uh, bowls. So I found these Japanese bowls. Uh, there was a, a teapot set that I wanted to grab the kettle from. See if I can find that. Yeah, so this one, this Japanese teapot set. So I wanted to make sure to grab that kettle. And then additionally, I wanted to make sure that I got some, uh, the coffee beans as well. So that's, the coffee beans are a separate um, element in here as well. So yeah, so I downloaded all of those and I just kind of wanted to start building them up in my scene. Oh, and I also wanted the plant. So there was a, I just search for a plant and I grabbed this interior plant, Calathea. I'm sorry, I'm not very good with plants, uh, but that's that's where I went from there. So I went ahead and grabbed those, uh, downloaded them, got them in, into a folder. And then once I have them in this folder, I can just drag and drop them into my scene. So I've got my coffee beans, I'll drop those in. And then I will grab, ba, 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 ba. I can just grab them all at the same time. So the plant, the bowl, and the teapot, just grab all those in here. Awesome. And for the, the plant, I'll uh, kind of throw that up here for the uh, coffee. I've got the, oh, I didn't only grab that one. So we get the bowl in here and I'll also throw in the teapot. There we go. Okay, cool. So for the bowl, I, I knew I kind of, like I was just kind of positioning those around um, where I needed them to be. So I'll just kind of put that kind of up there. And I, I kind of wanted it to be kind of tight, um, but also a little bit, like make it feel cozy, but not crowded, uh, that type of feeling. So I just kind of wanted to space this stuff out. And again, I wanted to, knew the camera was going to be kind of up here. Um, and then I can just start laying it out. So the thing that's really nice about doing this is that again, you can get an idea of where you really want to focus your attention when you're doing your material work. Because again, if this plant is just on the corner of the screen and it's out of focus or it's in shadow or something, I know that I don't have to spend that much time on it. So with that in mind, um, I'll just go ahead and start laying these out. Now, the big question is how am I going to do these coffee beans? Because traditionally, um, for anybody that's, that's ever worked in 3D before, uh, you know that that the coffee beans themselves don't have any sort of like, you know, um, uh, which we call it, like uh, physics out of the space. So it's, it's just going to pass through everything. If I tried to drop them on the ground, it would just pass through the ground. And like, there's nothing really you can do about that. So, uh, but we have some really great tools inside of Stager that allow us to do collision, that allow us to 
to position these more naturally. So I'll do that here in a second, but the first thing I wanna do is I just wanna create my camera in this spot so that I can switch back and forth between my kind of render camera and um, my my working viewport camera. So I'm gonna click the camera, add the camera icon here at the top. See, I'll get this great box around. And now I can start kind of laying out the way that I want this to, to look. Like I'll change the focal length. I'll, I, I made this one a little bit more telephoto. And, um, and then I, you know, you can start adjusting depth of field too. For that, you want to turn your ray tracing on. Um, and then I can set my focal point by clicking this button and just saying what I want to focus in on. And then I can just adjust the blur amount if I need to. Um, so again, all of this stuff is temp and just slugging it out. It's, it's, it's meant to be, it's just sketching. It's just ideas. So don't feel too permanent about anything. This will change as you're adding materials or adding components to it. So, okay, let me switch over to my viewport camera. Now I can move this around without uh, affecting uh, affecting uh, this camera as well. So I'm hitting my little tilde key to switch back and forth between them. All right, cool. Great, so let's position these coffee beans now. So inside of Stager is a lovely collision tool. To access that, you just go up here in your scene stack, your scene graph, and you just click this little, next to each object, uh, you'll see this little, it looks like two boxes bumping into each other. And I can just left mouse button and swipe through that. And I'm just gonna go ahead and select all of my beans as well as the bowl and the ground plane. Because I'm gonna want everything to kind of stack up on there. If I if I, if I also wanted to look like throw them in and around the bag, I can do I can activate the bag too. Now, the key thing to remember about this is whether you're putting the collision on the individual objects or the parent, like, or I would do it up here on the parent uh, coffee bean root. Now, the difference is, is if you think about like a, like, um, like actually, let's think about this coffee pot. So this coffee pot, if I wanted the collision on this, if I wanted this coffee pot to stay together, I would turn collision on for the pot itself and then drop it into the floor and it would, um, and it would collide just with the floor, right? Boom, boom. And it all stays together. But if I wanted each a component to function individually, I would go in here, turn all of those on, and now when I can, now when I, now when I uh, have these selected, and I drop it down to the ground, they can function more independently. Let's see. They didn't in that particular case. And usually, the stuff like falls out, but you can get an idea of whether it's it's functioning as an individual component or as a as a unit so that's that's kind of the distinction there so for the coffee beans we definitely want them just putting this back to where it was cool so for the coffee beans themselves we we do want those to to function individually so i'm going to grab the coffee beans themselves and make sure that um and make sure that they are um that i don't have the the ground plane I'm like, let's find out my ground plane here where'd you go all right, back to the beans themselves. All right, so for the individual beans, what I want to do is I want to select, again, just their individual components because I want them to acting independently, not as a group. Um, and then from there, I've got five of them already, but that's not going to fill up a bowl. So I can go ahead and start duplicating by hitting Control D. And I'll duplicate some up here. I'll just rotate. And I'll just move these up here. And then you can start, like, rotating them and just kind of moving them around a little bit just so that they're not, like, perfectly uniform with the other ones. Um, and then I can, you know, now grab, now I've got 10 of these. I can duplicate those. I think control D, sending them up, rotating that around. Okay, now I've got 20 of them. Grab those, duplicate, and on and on you go, right? Until you're ready to start um, positioning in the, in the bowl itself. And so now I will grab all of them. And let's say, you know, we do kind of want to sprinkle them around the bowl a little bit. So I will just like allow them to kind of live right there on the edge. And then you can just drop them down and they'll all start to kind of stack up and, and pile and do, and do what, what coffee beans inside a bowl would naturally do. So let me go ahead and just, uh, and then once I get that, I can duplicate that again, grab all of these, lift them up again, drop them back down again, and they will continue to go and build and mold and change and there's always one goofball that lands like right on the edge. So I'm just gonna go ahead and just drop that in here as well. Oh, moving them the wrong way. Dropping it down. 
So now I'm just gonna leave those as is, but you can see for my final scene, the way that I like continued to build that out more and more and more and more. So what I also wanna do is I also wanna lay out the rough lighting at this point. Cause again, we've got the, um, you know, the coffee beans, we've got some depth of field, we've got the camera positioned roughly where we want. This isn't quite centered, but I can do that. Now what I wanna do is, is do my lighting. So going back to the reference, you can see that again, dark, moody, focusing the light on just like a couple of the main elements, really centering our focus on the product or the, the whatever the main area of focus is. So we'll lean into that idea as well. So for that, there's, there's two ways that you can go about it. Um, but overall, just know that if, if you're trying to create a more isolating lighting standpoint like that, you're going to want a couple things. You're going to want to control it through individual light sources, and you're going to want to minimize the overall lighting environment. So inside of Stager by default, there's this like overall, uh, it's called HDRI lighting. And I'll kind of zoom out here so you can see it. Um, turn this on and turn off the blur. There's like kind of a light rig that exists all around the object, right? And that's what's driving the lighting initially in our scene. The thing is, is like this will be too strong to really get that like dark element uh, to our scene. So what I'm gonna wanna do is go into our light settings and just for the time being, just tone this down. Again, like it'll be dark, but it's totally fine because we're about to add some other light sources. Now the two light sources that I said that you can add that are really beneficial inside our little light tab here are spotlights and area lights. Spotlights are great because they allow you, if I pull one in, they allow you to really kind of focus in on like a certain area. So if I want to kind of zoom it in here, I'll turn on my exposure so you can kind of see that a little bit more. And then like this outer angle radius will really kind of help me zone in on specific elements. And for softening the shadows, I can turn up the emitter radius and, and kind of do that too. Um, I also really, really like the quality of um, area lights. And I actually use one of those in the seat. Now, the downside of an area light is I don't have that same edge control to kind of focus the attention in that way. So I'll have to do it a little bit differently. So for that, I've got my area light in here. I'll go ahead and pull this out a little bit. Um, and I kind of want it at like a low glancing angle to get nice long shadows, nice dark values. Um, and I'm going to turn that up and then increase the width. So it's important here with the area light to increase the width and height um, in the parameter area down here. Because it, it, what it happens is, is when you increase it there, it actually increases or it softens out. The, like you see how soft these shadows are now. And um, it, 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 if I just did it interactively in the window, it wouldn't necessarily do that. And you could, you'll see me switching back and forth between these two viewports. Uh, Stager currently does not have the ability for multiple viewports. So I can't see them both at the same time. I do imagine that would come at some point, but for right now, it's a little bit of a bummer, but you gotta switch back and forth between them. All right, cool. So now that I've got that, I can start to see like, oh, actually this plant is casting too much shadow on this. So I'll just go ahead and slide that plant over a little bit uh, to kind of get that out of the way. I love the idea that it's casting a shadow. I just don't want it kind of on the main element. So I can, you know, move that, rotate it around a little bit. Oh, that's kind of nice there. And I can kind of zero it in that way, right? Uh, and then same thing, you can also, because you don't have control uh, over the outer light rig, what I can do is I can put some props just off camera. Um, Cause like, let's say I wanted these coffee beans to be in shadow a little bit. I can just like, I've got this plant selected. I'll duplicate that, sl oops, slide that over. And you can see now that it's, it's off camera, but it's now casting this shadow down there as well. So feel free to use some off camera components to help, you know, build out your composition and get your dark values the way that you are. Uh, and I'll jump back into my version of this and I'll kind of show you what my final layout was. Okay. So now in my layout, you can see that I've got the, I've got more beans, obviously, uh, the cylinder representing the cup, all this stuff. And then for my overall thing, same deal. I just, I ended up, I didn't, oh, I didn't end up actually using a spotlight. I thought I used an area light. Nope. Spotlight with a giant radius. And I also, you can see the, um, the contortion I did with this off camera plant. Now, did I necessarily need 
to um, to use a full plant in this. Uh, no, there's probably some lower geometry thing I could have used, but I, I liked the like natural organic look of the leaves themselves casting shadow, so I really wanted to keep that. But yeah, so use the objects in your scene, use objects off camera to kind of cast shadows into your scene and really create the composition and overall look that you want. Once I have my layout done, I've got my blocking done, and again, this is all totally temporary. Um, you can swap this out as you're going through the process, but this just allows me to, to, to refine and kind of focus in my final look. The next step in this process is I want to jump in and really, I, I, I want to start applying materials to these objects. And the way that I do it is I will generally work from largest to smallest, meaning what's taking up the most tree real estate and then narrowing it down and down and down to the more detailed stuff. Uh, in this particular case, just because I want to introduce you all to another application called Substance Sampler, we're going to focus on this um, uh, tabletop surface that everything is lying upon. I, I actually like to do that because it's a good foundation and it's the element that appears across the entire image and really is going to be like our bonding common element. So I want to start there. And again, looking back at our reference, it's all wood, man. Everything is wood, rich, colors, lots of warmth and all that good stuff. And now I'm going to jump into Substance Sampler to kind of show you how I, I am able to uh, create that based off of just a photograph. So yes, so Substance Sampler's main use case is taking a simple photograph like this. Again, this can be something you take with your iPhone. It can be something fancier, like a scan on a fancy scanner. Uh, in this particular case, I just grabbed this image from Adobe Stock um, because it allowed me to... I really liked it because it had some good grain to it. Um, I like the, the soft uh, shape of it that's not too knotty. Um, and I really like the rich kind of varying colors in it as well. And what Sampler is able to do is to take a simple image like this and actually convert it into a digital material really easily and in a way that kind of gives you ultimate control. Um, so how did I get this? So I got this um, by importing the uh, material here and adding a bunch of individual components to get this final look. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just click this tab to make a new material. Um, ba -ba -ba. All right, cool. I got a new untitled material. Awesome. Uh, in the middle here is just a, a little preview spheres because again this is all about authoring just materials so um what you can do is you can click this viewer setting and change that out and you can do like shirts or rounded cylinders or whatever actually in this case let's do a plane because we're going to be doing this as our flat bar surface so let's go ahead and and leave it somewhere nice and flat um to take a look at it now let's import that image so to do that i will just click here off to the side i can also just drag and drop it from my desktop as well and I will select this image. When I do that, I get this lovely dialog box that's saying, oh, okay, I know that you want to turn this image into a material. Awesome. It knows what you want to do. It selects the right thing um, pretty much out of the gate almost every time. Um, and it allows you to start the process very easily. So it's like, okay, let's import this material. I'll use some AI powered or B2M powered stuff. And if you need a description, there's descriptions of each over here that will allow you to convert this into a material. Awesome, so you wanna add a base material. There's also this line here, I just wanna draw attention to it real quick, it's the set physical size. If you wanna activate that, what this does is it gives you two options for applying metadata to your material so that you that the software knows how big it actually is in the real world. Now, where this is beneficial is if you are trying to replicate something like a fabric or just a specific material and you want it to appear the correct, like you want to know that it's the correct size, you, what you can do is, is, is you can um, do one of two ways of calculating that measurement. Number one is the auto measure tool. Uh, in this case, I'll click this and it automatically does it because uh, that, this only works if it's scanned data, if it's from a scanned image, because the scanned data will have DPI information in it that will allow you to say like, oh, it's this many, you know, uh, dots per inch, therefore this overall scan is this long. Um, and then additionally, you can use a manual measure tool. If you click this, it'll bring up your image. So if you take a photograph with your phone and you throw on a ruler or something, you say, well, from this part of the ruler to this part of the ruler is 25 you know, centimeters. Therefore, it'll update the rest of this and say, oh, it's it, the whole thing is 38 centimeters long. So it's a good way to, to estimate the, an accurate uh, size of your, of your material. Anyway, 
um, for that. And then once you have that, you can just click import. Uh, it's going to create your base material. It's going to add your image and it's going to use this AI powered or B2M powered image to material to start giving you your, your final look. So out of the gate, um, you'll see there's some pretty clear cut lines and, and edges as to where this is. So it's not tiling up that well, but there's some simple tools in here we can add to, to change that. The other thing I always check right after I open something is I just, I always just go into my settings down here um, and make sure that tiling makes sense that like if I want to add a bunch of tiles or in this case, it's fine to just have two. Um, and I also want to check my displacement because you know, if like sometimes you get stuff that comes in and it's like, whoa, that's not what I wanted. So you just want to make sure that height scale is, and for something flat like this, just keep it nice and low um, because there's not going to be that much displacement in your in your final render. So just want to keep it nice, nice and nice and even there. So we're not getting any weird artifacting or anything like that. Again, that doesn't actually matter for the final object. It's just uh, it's just how you how it's previewed inside of uh, Sampler itself. Okay, so the first thing I do is I go into my image to material um, note here, and I just want to make sure that everything. Uh, everything is functioning the way that I that kind of want like because again all this stuff is like kind of automated So what I want to do is just go through the sliders, you know Check the the geometry details and make sure that it's not like over smoothing and losing detail or 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 you know Because again either because you have and I'll show you this in the next one So the next node that we'll add is the equalize node. This really does a fantastic job of lessening kind of contrast both in the value and in the color across it um, but you get the slider for radius and I'll show you what happens. So if I tone it down, you'll see that it's becoming more and more tileable. And like, you know, if I turn it all the way down, you you do not see a seam line edge at all. But the other thing that you don't see is anything that's related to the original material. So it's it's obliterated the detail um, in order to create that tiling. So what you want to do is you want to just kind of find that happy medium point for your individual asset. Once you have that, um, it's all about kind of like once you have like your values feeling pretty good and pretty cohesive across the board, then it's a matter of eliminating these hard edges around the side. For this particular one, I used what we, uh, one of our tools called Make It Tile. What Make It Tile does is it allows you to reset where the transition happens from one tile to the next. So you've got this threshold and you can see it's, it's uh, just kind of changing that out. Now, once you kind of uh, identify a good spot that's not like on a you know, a nod or something that's really super obvious. You can then like, you can smooth it down if you wanted to, or adjust the contrast and get a better idea. So like, and that does really does a good job of like, sm again, smoothing everything out and making it feel, uh, making it harder for the audience to distinguish where one thing stops and the other one begins. On top of that, if I'm finding that these wood grains are a little bit too repeatable and I want to simplify those a little bit, you can also use tools that are your common, commonly aware of inside of Photoshop or Illustrator, like a clone stamp. I guess it would be more Photoshop, but you know, if I wanted to sample from this area and then paint out this, I could do that. And now that that main, uh, you know, like that main ridge is gone. Uh, or I can go in and use a tool called the Content Aware Fill, which is similar to clone stamping without sourcing something. It's using AI to understand. So, like, if I wanted to take this out, I'll just you know paint around this. And then give it a second to do its its witchcraft, and you'll see it update and kind of eliminate that stuff out. And I can do it down here too. So it's it's a really nice way of of, of eliminating kind of repeatable stuff. Um, so what ends up happening is is like okay, cool. Let's say we're done with that, and we've got this lovely tileable texture that we're ready to roll with. The next step is to define the look of it, because again, we've kind of lost some of the contrast and the brightness that was in our original that I like so much. But now that we have it like nice and kind of even, I can start to bring some of that back um, because it will do it more uniformly and, and less like kind of in a, in a patchier idea. So I can bring back up my contrast and brightness. And then once I do that, um, it kind of messes with the uh, hue and saturation a little bit. So I can, I can then bring down the saturation while increasing that contrast a, a little bit. So I can kind of play with these two at the same time. All right, so now we've got some nice variation in there. Um, I could continue to build that out too and say things like, all right, awesome. You know, we've also got this wood finish in here to help define the look. Cause one thing that happens with scans is it kind of flattens out the lighting overall. And now I, what I can do is, uh, if I start to rotate this light around, you can start to see some different finishes on here. And I kind of get it like a glancing angle. Like this is a natural finish. I can get a lovely varnish, a matte varnish, um, a raw 
or a sawn wood, like whatever, um, whatever type of finish you want to your, um, to your flooring, you can add there. Now, one of the things that, that came up was like, I don't know how much, if I wanted to be mad varnish or varnish or whatever, I probably want to decide that inside a stager. But the thing is, I don't want to have to like go back at a sampler every time I make any sort of modification. So we've got this tool inside of here that allows you to expose these parameters inside of sampler to the other applications. And this not only works inside of Substance, but also works inside of uh, if you're using Maya or Unreal or Clow or something like that. <coughs> uh, it's seen it will work in all of those applications as well because we have plugins with them and, and all of that um, stuff can read the individual parameters. So to expose that parameter, it could not be easier. You just right click on finish type and say expose this parameter and that's it. You get a little blue dot here, a blue dot there that tells you, awesome, this is now exposed to be used. Uh, I can do that also with like my saturation and with my brightness or contrast or whatever I want there. So now after like after I'm done exporting this, I'll have total control over this um, in my final in my final rendering uh, engine. To export it, you just click the share button off to the right hand side. And in this case, I'm gonna send it directly into Substance Stager, but you can also export it as a SBSAR, which is the the you know, like the material type. Again, if you wanted to save that for your desktop, send it to somebody else to use. You can, again, use that and import that into a Clo, Browseware, Maya, Cinema 4D, VRED, whatever the heck else you're using. Um, and you can control the, um, the output resolution as well. Or if you want, you can say that you want to export each one of these individual maps as an EXR file or a PNG or a TIP for a JPEG or whatever. Um, it's, it's honestly, it's, it's however you want to export it to use in any other application. Um, but in our use case, and again, I'll jump back over into my original. Um, I want to use this inside of Stager on this table. So I'll go ahead and have that table selected and go back into Sampler. And then all I have to do is click the share button and then say send to Substance Stager. It'll go, I'll get my little pinwheel thing going round and round. All right. And just like that, I've got it inside of Substance Stager now. And what I can do is I can start to position that. So it's the wood grain isn't going the exact way that I want. So I went ahead and just uh, rotate that around. So now it's going a little bit horizontal. I kind of want it to go like, I, I kind of want to be nitpicky about which way it's going. So I'm just go ahead and rotate that about 110 degrees. I also want to scale this down. So I'll increase the repeating on it. And then now that I have that, I can go in and, and adjust all those individual uh, controls that I have. So if I wanted to go back to like a matte varnish or a raw, I, I can I can go in and do that a little bit more and then adjust again the overall brightness. So let's go ahead and just take down that brightness to make it a little bit of a darker wood color. And I'll take down the saturation as well. All right, cool. And now I've got like that nice warm wood base that I was looking for. And it was very, very easy to do that in sampler, just using a basic image. And from there I can go in and continue to build out. So the next main thing that I really want to focus on is our coffee bag. And for the design of the coffee bag, I kind of wanted to dive into uh, both painter and designer. But before I do that, I really kind of want to wrap my head around what this coffee bag label is going to look like. So again, like I said, from our reference, I pulled um, some of these logos. And what I did was I just, I just kind of created variations on them. So I've got uh, a few different ones. I've got them with the, um, you know, with the kind of the, the, the word sunset on there as well as a nice little like logo element. I created a bunch of different ones. So I've got like, um, them in, in alpha channel form so that they're just like black and whites that I can use. And, um, and then I also have this label again, grab, I grabbed it, this, uh, from stock initially. Um, and then I just modified it so I can, I can actually show it to you, uh, inside of the stock library. So again, here was the sunset. Um, so again, here was the, the sunset logo that I grabbed these from. And then the coffee bag. So this is 
uh, uh, this is what it originally was. And then I went through and I modified it and then I put in my own branding and changed some of the wording. And I, I added a different logo down here just because I like this one a little bit better. Uh, and now I know that I'm like, okay, cool. So I want this to be the label on the bag and I want to use my logos, um, you know, either this one or this one on, on the bag itself, right? So that, that's kind of the basis that I'm going for. So for starters, if I'm talking about um, being more specific and really designing the look of an individual prop, that means I'm going into Substance Painter. So let's hop into Substance Painter and I'll explain it a little bit as we get in there. All right, so this is the bag that I built inside of Substance Painter and I'm gonna kind of go through step-by-step uh, step how I created this. Now, I'm not gonna go into super detail because I have an entire painter course on my YouTube channel, which you can find the link down below um, if you wanna find out more about painter itself. So let me go ahead and just um, take this down to the, that again, that base bag model, which again, in order to get this, I just simply selected it here inside of Stager. Um, I exported it uh, as a OBJ file. And then I imported that into, um, into Painter just by going File, New, uh, clicking this uh, Select button and bringing it in. And then all I've done so far is, is I've also, I baked, baked out the texture maps as well. Again, if you wanna know anything about that, check out the uh, Substance Painter course as well. Okay, so to get things started, uh, Substance Painter is all about just like layering on the, the natural materials. So for starters, I just grabbed uh, the paper cardboard that is either in here by default, uh, or if you need to click this bottom button here, this will throw you over into your uh, Creative Cloud desktop app. And I can just search for cardboard inside of our um, stock. And then I've got some different cardboard selections here. I think it was just cardboard paper, if I remember right. And to send this over to Painter, all I have to do is click the Send To button and say Send To Painter. And there it is. And then you can just drag and drop it onto the object. Um, in this particular case, I went ahead and, oh, it's the paper cardboard. So I kind of wanted to start there and because like this, I figured this bag is going to be made out of some sort of paper product. And I kind of wanted that, uh, that, that kind of fabric, that fiber as the underneath. Um, on top of that, I added a, uh, was, I was just looking at the different plastics because I just kind of wanted like a nice, um, a kind of a smooth one on, on top of that. So I added this glossy polyurethane and then change that to the blue color. But what's nice about it is you've got that kind of shininess, but you're also still getting the texture of the cardboard underneath. So literally it was just a matter of adding that and then just changing the resin color texture. Now, the one thing that I did um, to, to kind of make this a little bit more believable was I added what's called an anchor. Point. So I'll, 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 do, I'll do this next step from scratch because this, this might be interesting to somebody. Um, okay, so let's say I wanted to use this color, whatever it is, and I, I could change it to drive something that's happening up above it. So to do that, I'm just going to say, click this little magic wand button and say, add anchor point. It adds an, uh, an anchor that has the same name as this. Awesome. How do I use that? So for the next layer, I'll create a new fill layer. I will say that I, I just want to affect the color. So I'll turn off these other ones. And then for the, what the color is is I'm gonna click this, the base color button, and go into my anchor points and say that. Awesome, great. Um, so I've, all I've done is create a layer of the exact same color underneath it. Awesome, that doesn't really do anything. So how do I want to adjust it? So I want to go up to this magic wand, add a filter, and inside my filters, I will say uh, HSL or the hue saturation lightness. And all I'm gonna do is just lighten this up a little bit. Maybe take off some saturation. With the idea being is, is basically I'm going to use this layer to create a little bit, like a super minor amount of like wear around the edges of the bag to make it feel a little bit more believable and actually manufactured. So how do I isolate it to just the edges? Boom. Um, you know, I can either go in here, create a black mask for this, and I can start painting and like I can just paint those edges, but that gets super tedious. So instead we can actually use one of our generators and the generators can look at the curvature. Again, this is why we bake out those texture maps. Um, and then I can use just sliders here to really isolate that down to just, just kind of those edges a little bit. And just to create a minor bit 
of like lightness and variation around the curve points of this. Cause again, if it's like a kind of a sturdier plastic bag, it's gonna get a little bit of that wear and tear. And then I can, you know, just kind of take that down. Again, it's not a huge difference, but just like sometimes these subtle variations and subtle nuances can really, um, can really make a big difference. All right, and then and then what I did was I, I added the label on top. Um, in this particular case, to get the label on, all I did was I created a new layer. I imported um, the, the coffee label into my asset library um, inside of the textures. Let's see, where's that? There it is. And then all you have to do is drag and drop it over into your base color. Switch into your 2D, I'll just go straight to my 2D view. And then all I did was just kind of like scale it down and position it into into place. And I just turned off on UV wrap, if you just say to repeat to none, then you can just um, scale this up. And if I jump back into, I'll do my split 3D to 2D view, um, you can just kind of position it out that way. Here we go. That's it. All right, cool. So I've got that. And I am, oh, and then the other thing I did is I just, I turned down, I think I turned down the roughness on this. Um, yeah, I turned down the roughness to make it a little bit more shiny. Just kind of make it a shinier packaging thing. Um, okay, now the pattern itself. I know that I wanted to put um, this type of a pattern onto the back itself. How do I do that? Um, so you actually, I actually did not do that inside of um, Substance Painter. I did that inside of Substance Designer and then sent it over to Substance Painter. And I will show you that in the next step. All right, so Substance Designer. Uh, what is Substance Designer? This is another material authoring tool similar to Sampler, except for instead of using, you know, photographic image, you can create anything that you want from scratch. This is an incredibly powerful tool and basically all of the, or I should not say all, almost all of the materials that exist in the 3D asset library were created using Substance Designer. Now, uh, some of these were also used, uh, you know, just, just used by scans. But if you ever want to like go into any one of these, um, let's say this, this uh, trunk one, you can actually download, instead of the SDSAR, which is the, the material, I'd actually download the SBS file and open that directly into Designer to see how it was made. And the way that Designer works, it's it's a series of nodes or simple um, operations that come together step by step to build the final look. Um, it gets very complex, so I don't usually get into too much detail with with beginners. And the reason is um, that if like you're a designer person, you'll dive into this world, right? But for most, like, you know, 2D artists or for even even for me, for the most part, my main use case for designer is, is creating patterns. Like, I love using it to make patterns, something like simple like this. So let's let's let me show you how I did this. So basically, I started with a couple of those um, materials that I uh, created for our logo. And to get them into Substance, it's, it's really easy. I can just take the, um, the the logos that I have here. I forget which ones they are. Yeah, I'm just, I think they're these two. And I can just drag and drop them in. And you can either link them or import the resource. So, yep, cool. That's awesome. Let's go ahead and bring those two, those two, uh, those two in here. Awesome. There they are, and they are ready to go. The one thing is, is that the way that I set these up probably could have been a little bit better. But basically, I, I these are being brought in from the alpha channel and kind of the RGB channel just kind of looks like this. So um, the way that I, I fixed that was I just shuffled out or I grabbed the alpha channel to work with. So to do that, all you need to do to get, um, and there's multiple ways that you can get a new node in here. Um, you can either go over here to the side and look through all the ones that, that currently exist. There's a bunch up here at the top. These are called the atomic nodes. These are the ones that you're going to be using most often. Um, but in this particular case, I just I can also just hit tab and start typing in that I want. So I know that I want to just grab this channel shuffle, and then you can just plug it, plug these things in, right? Um, I can either plug them in the top, 
or you know, there's multiple inputs on them. So just plug them in the top and I say for the red channel, I want my alpha, alpha, alpha. Great, awesome. So now I have that. And for this bottom one, I'm just gonna make a copy of it, replug it into this one. And now I've got the same exact thing here. Awesome, so that's, that's how I kind of built that up. Now I wanna use these in my pattern. By the way, that step isn't always necessary. It just was in this case because uh, I exported them out of um, out of Photoshop uh, without the right channel. And I wanted to keep it in the tutorial just in case you all had the same thing. Okay, cool. Now, the next step is you want to tile these out, right? You want to make your pattern. So inside of, of Designer, we've got this thing called, uh, we've got a couple of different tile uh, generators. You can randomize tile stuff. You can sample tile stuff. You can do uh, whatever you need to do. Uh, in this particular case, I'm using the tile sampler just because it gives me more control. So you can see over here, there's a whole bunch of inputs, uh, but the main ones that we're gonna be working on for this are just a uh, pattern input one. So I'm just gonna go ahead and apply this to that. And the one downside is that like out of the gate, it just looks like a bunch of squares. You're like, wait, what the heck? I just plugged my thing in. You've got to go down into the parameters here and change it from pattern, change the pattern from square to pattern input. Actually do it, here we go. And now you can see all of these. Uh, this is way too many. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and tone this down a little bit and say, we'll do like four by four, just out of the gate, just so you can see it. All right, cool. So now we've got that, but like, hey, wait, I've actually got two of these logos that I wanna get in, but I've only got one pattern input. Well, we've actually got an input number down here. And the second I slide this from one to two, or if I make more of them, you can see the inputs are updating up there at the top. So I've got pattern input one and two. So now I can slide that down here. And for the distribution distribution of them, <coughs> you can change that from random to like, you can you can make it like a, an even pattern. Uh, but in, in, in my particular case, I wanted to, to go ahead and keep them random um, just to, just to kind of add a little variation in there. Now, and this is basically all I need because now I can go down here and I can start messing with this stuff, right? So we've got, you know, I can either scale them up or down, um, but there's also this scale random. So I can scale them at different sizes. So they're different, uh, they're different sizes. I could also um, change the offset their position. I can randomize their position a little bit. I can randomize their rotation. And what ends up happening is, is that, and then I can go back in and I can adjust the scale back up a little bit too. And what happens is, is now the great thing about this is this is tileable by like just automatically, like you don't have to do, you don't have to do anything. So if I hit this button here, that'll tile out the repeating. You'll see that this, it doesn't matter where the edge is. It just repeats forever and ever and ever. And if you want to visualize it on a uh, 3D object, I'll just right click and say view in a uh, 3D view. And then you'll just say the it's just the base color. So you just want to put in the base color. Awesome. And so now anytime that I'm adjusting one thing, um, you can see it updated everywhere else too. Now, uh, one like quick little UI thing about designer to be aware of is that if I want to view this node, I double click on it. But if I wanted to like make an adjustment to this node, I would single click on it. So you can look through one and, and adjust another one. And then once you're done, um, I've got this this out output because the way that I created this from scratch, I should have mentioned this earlier, is I did file new, uh, new substance graph and the graph type, I actually created um, a generic uh, painter filter. And that brought in this output node that allows me to then just take this and I can click this little box with an arrow icon. And I can say now send this over into substance painter once I'm ready for, for my pattern. And once I have that here, um, it's inside my filters. Wait, what do, let, me, let me double check what it's called. Uh, I'll just do sunshine coffee. And there it is in my filters node, awesome. And now I, what I can do, so I'll turn this off here, is I can now add a new layer, uh, bum, 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 put it down below, I labeled. And what I can do is I can make a black mask here and then a fill of my black mask. Again, if now that makes sense, check the <laughs> check the painter tutorial and I just dropped it in. 
And now I've got my lovely pattern driving this and, um, and, and creating my little pattern. And then I was able to adjust it at the end. And that's how I got the pattern on the bag. Now, to get this into my scene, all I need to do is do a same send to functionality and I'll say file, send to, and then send it over to stager. And once it gets here, it'll actually drop the bag in the middle of the scene. Um, but a little a fun little uh, tip on this one is the, the thing that's, that's most important is you, if you look down here in your project materials, I can see I've got my bag coffee here. So, because it's kind of a pain in the butt to have to, uh, you can see the, the, the new coffee bag was dropped in at the origin point, but I don't want it there. So I'll just go ahead and delete that one. And if I go back to my camera, what I can do is take this bag coffee and just drag and drop it on there. And now it's, this is the same bag. It's the same everything. Like I, it'll, I can keep it in my slugged out location. Um, and it now appears here. So awesome, right? So in terms of, um, in terms of time, I, I just wanted to show that I did th pretty much the exact same thing um, with some of the other elements too, like the teapot, say. And I'll kind of go through each one of these individually. So this is the teapot that I made. Um, it's nothing crazy to it. I'll, I'll go through each each component individually. Just gonna turn these off. And I'll start with the body. So for the body, and again, I shouldn't say this, my having my layout the way it was made me go like, okay, cool. You know, this this coffee pot's just kind of in the corner of the screen. Like, I don't need to give it too much detail on it, but I'll throw something on there um, uh, just so it's 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 looking rad. So I added our new, uh, just like a base ceramic material. Uh, this is ancient rough ceramic. And I like it because it's just like, again, just gives me those contours. And, uh, you know, just, just, just like a base level I can build on. And then there's this shiny earth enamel that I think is just beautiful. And I threw that on there and then to top it off. I just put on these little bumps and all this is, is a fill layer. And my settings are the colors dark. Um, and then I added a little bit of height to it, like literally 0.02. And then inside my mask, I just use these, uh, these grunge spots. And I'm just, you know, like I can balance those up. I can scale them if I needed to. Like if I wanted to make giant bumps, I could do that. Um, but in this particular case, I wanted them to be nice and small and add it on top there. Uh, for the bolts on the side, I went super, I just added a chrome plating. That's it. Just like a little nut on there. And then for the, the handle itself, um, I did a black leather on top and I isolated it um, in my mask. So again, I just grabbed the mask and inside of our, our masking setting, again, I can paint on it or I can use this little button here combined with this checkerboard that allows me to select, um, different components. And so I can just say, I just want it on the tops and then I can do the exact same thing for the sides. And for the sides, I just use a, um, another leather skin that was a little bit lighter in color to kind of be like that frayed edge. Uh, and that's it for the teapot. And then I sent that over, um, did the same thing for the uh, coffee beans. People have seen me use my coffee beans in other demos. Um, again, that's just, I just used cr cracked buffalo leather on those guys. Um, made some minor adjustments. I, I painted in the I wanted the center of them to be a little bit darker, so I painted in some uh, darkness in there. Um, but that's pretty much it. It's just like a default leather material that's thrown on the beans, and I sent that over. <clears throat> I also, um, just looking at reference, I turned down the, the roughness way down because I wanted the beans to be nice and shiny and crisp and new. Um, and then the last one was the... Um, oh, the bowl. The bowl itself underneath the beans. So again, I just, you know, keep super simple. I just use this stylized enamel. And I thought, I, I honestly thought like I was just using that as a temp, but, um, but in reality, like it ended up looking pretty good. So that's actually what's inside this final one here as well. So I thought that that worked out okay. And then for, oh, for the plant too. Um, the plant was another one. I actually didn't make this one. I, this was an homage. So one of the guys that I work with who um, 
I truly, truly respect and admire is a guy named Wes McDermott. And he actually built this one. Um, and so as like a little homage to him internally, I just threw his plant in there as well. But just to show, the, I mean, the only thing that's unique about this is that he used the, for the leaf, that, for each leaf themselves, there's a, um, a, a library material called the Calathea blah, blah, blah leaf. And I'll just show you how, how we did that. Um, but, oh, but basically once you, if you, uh, say leaf, I think it's in here, it should be in here. Oh yeah. For this one, um, should turn off one of them. Let's see where it turns it off at. All right. So for that one, yeah. Okay, cool. So for that, all you have to do is hold down the control key and drag, oh, is it control? Sorry. Alt, alt, alt. And you can, you hold that down and then you can drop this leaf material on top here. And then all you, all you have to do is just, um, take this and then you can just kind of warp it and extend it onto the, the leaf itself. And it kind of contours to the geometry. And then once you have that in position, you can use the, uh, you know, use these sliders to, in, you know, increase the infection slot, you know, infections on the edges or spots or, or whatever. Um, and that's how we got the leaf going on that. So I added that to the scene as well. Now the final step in the process was this coffee cup. And I wanted to, again, I, I wanted to make that from scratch. I've got that reference and I really kind of wanted to dig into, um, on, uh, into how I built that, uh, into how I built that up a little bit. So for that, we actually used a uh, Substance 3D Modeler. All right, so here we are inside the Substance Modeler. Substance Modeler is a really great tool for creating some quick uh, 3D models for um, just some like concepting or or anything that you like that that um, it's just like a quick idea that you want to get down. It's very clay like and it's an approach. If you're used to uh, polygon based modeling tools, this is not that. It's it's a uh, SKG. I think I got those letters right. Um, it's basically a uh, uh, a clay uh, type of modeling that doesn't build the polygons until the very end when you're ready to export. So let's take a look at what that means. So basically you can start with this, um, you start with some like primitive objects and again, different than what most 3D users are used to, nothing is actually here yet until I hit the spacebar key. And then once I hit the spacebar key, then this thing is left. And if, but if I hold down the spacebar key, you can see I can like drag it out and make some like different uh, objects going in different directions that way. Now, uh, for this particular one, I wanna make a lovely coffee cup. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with a, I'm gonna delete that. I will start with a cylinder. Um, and I'll just go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. Awesome. And then I will uh, go into these uh, settings over here to adjust, uh, you know, I can either adjust like the thickness so I'll get the thickness of that. I will get the uh, little filleted edges just to kind of make it nice and soft and rounded. And when I'm happy with that general shape, I'll just hit the space bar. Awesome. Now I want to build out the bottom of it, right? I need the bottom of my cup. So for that, I'm just going to create another cylinder, um, increase the uh, scale on that so it matches what was there before. I'm going to go ahead and grab this little knob and take it down. And then I'll just slide it down to the bottom. Great, and when I have that ready to go, make that a little bit, little bit lower. Well, I just hit the space bar again. And now those two things are totally fused together. And I can go in here uh, and smooth it out. And there's a smoothing tool that allows me just kind of uh, smooth out those edges. So yeah, so now it's all just like one super smooth thing. So basically, now you can see how this is like clay, right? You're slapping different components on it and doing your thing. Um, additionally, I also want to um, use that same shape because I actually want there to be liquid inside this cup. So I'll just go ahead and, and position that where I want the liquid to be. Now, before I hit spacebar, the liquid is not an actual component of the cup. So I actually want it to be something else. So I'll right click and say new layer. It'll change the color of that. But now when I click spacebar, what it does is if I click this, you can see now these are two separate components. That's going to be important when it comes time to texturing this. Now for the handle, 
Um, I also I actually want to uh, create a new layer for that, and I'll show you why here in just a second. Because I want to uh, start. I'll start with a, a, a cube. I will actually um, take out the thickness of it a little bit. I will just kind of fillet the edges and round it down. So it's a nice, like, little rounded, a little bit of a taper to it. Um, and then I can go in here and I can adjust this out, squeeze that down, rotate it around. Oop, didn't need to do that. Rotate it around. And I can either rotate it arbitrary, or if I hold down the, sh uh, if I hold down the control key, I can, I can adjust it in increments. You can push it inside the cup, bring it down, scale it up this way. I need the thickness to be a little bit thicker than that. Um, here we go. Awesome. And if that's the shape that I want, cool. Just making sure that it is roughly in the right spot. Awesome. Great. Hit the space bar. And the reason why I created it as a separate component is you can see that inside the cup, there's like, uh, that's not how coffee handles work. Uh, they don't go inside the cup. So what I can do is go into our erase tool, create another cylinder, and just rotate that to 90 degrees. Right side. And then I can scale this up, the size of the cup. And now what this does is this allows me, once I hit the space bar here, It'll just uh, delete that component. But now once I have these two, I can shift select them together, right click and merge them together. And now they are one component. And then I can just kind of go through here and if I want to um, kind of smooth in those edges a little bit, that connection point, I can do that as well. I can make it a little bigger too. That's a little, there we go. Nice and smooth around the edges. Awesome. And if I wanted to, like, you can continue to build this out too. Like, the the great thing is, is that, you know, like you can, if you've ever taken a ceramics class, you can you can take that into account too. So things like the, um, uh, you know, I can put a, I'm going to go and scale this out. If I wanted to put like, a, like one of the things that you do in a, a ceramics class is you put a little ring on the bottom and I can smooth that out. but. For the purpose of this, I think that's that's enough for now. Because then once, what I can do now is I can take this and say File, Export, and it gives me all my export options. Because again, like we haven't built a single polygon yet. And what you can do is you can uh, tell it what output type you would like. Um, you would tell it how many, uh, like your target polygon count, and then whether or not you want to generate UVs or UV tiles. Um, and then once that's done, you just click Export, and from there, I can take it into Painter, and this is what I ultimately painted on top of it, right? So just uh, just because uh, I had a question about this when I initially posted this video as to like what the geometry looks like, and I'll just go ahead and show that here. So two things about the the geometry. So I'll go ahead and just show the wireframe mesh. So it's a little bit dense, and it's triangulated, which is why I, I talk about modelers being. Um, a great tool for like just ideating something and just knocking something out really quick. I wouldn't use it for like my hero prop uh, yet because you don't really have control. Unless I wanted to take this into like a Maya or a Blender or a ZBrush or something and retopologize it, uh, which I don't really want to do. Um, like this is, it's, it's, it's good geometry. It's clean geometry. It's not going to cause any problems, but it's also not super efficient. So just, just something to keep in mind there. And then in terms of the UVs that get auto generated, um, they look like this. Again, not ideal if this is a hero prop, but given the way that we can work inside a Substance Painter, it's not a problem. Because like these UV seams would be really problematic for some software, but because we can uh, use the triplanar method of material application inside of here, uh, it is all good. <laughs> so, um, and by that I just mean, I can show you that. So if, you, if you're more curious about that in um, you can check out the painter course, but if I added this concrete to it, let's see if I can find a seam line. Yeah. So like see the seam line here, um, this would be problematic except for I can go in and just say, you know what, instead of don't, just completely ignore the UVs, 
uh, we'll just try planner this. And now what that does is it it'll it'll help ignore uh, some of those those seam lines and that kind of thing. So that's that that can be pretty helpful too. All right, cool. So for getting this, um, let's start with the the coffee foam on top actually, because this one was it's a complex looking thing, but it's actually super easy to achieve. So inside of the asset library, I can go back and just search for coffee. And yeah, so I just grabbed this coffee foam. Awesome. Um, and then I just downloaded that, slapped it on top there. And all I all I usually do with this is I'll, I, I have two different ones just because I want to limit, I want to make some adjustments around the edges so that, because I don't want any bubbles like intersecting with the edge of that. So that's, that's literally, I mean, it's pretty much just like a straight application on top. And then for the cup itself, uh, let's go ahead and do this. So I got a little fancy with this. Again, I say I use that same wet clay that was on the pot. Um, and then I just wanted to lay out some colors. So for this one, I actually used uh, our cork material. And then I took down everything, because like, I'm only adjusting the color, like, so I took off all this other stuff. So it's, you know, we're not getting any of the height elements or anything like that. I'm just dealing with color while it's still picking up what's underneath. And then I just added a little bit of a, under our filters, there's a, a blur. And just because I wanted, I just wanted like that natural cork color as my base color. Um, and then on top of that, I added our uh, white glaze. So again, just, uh, this is just a, uh, a fill on top with a white with the roughness turned down a little bit. And then I just went in there uh, with my paint and I just like painted, uh, painted like a rough section of it. Because I knew that my next section was this blue line that would take care of the details of it. So inside my blue line, uh, again, I just kind of painted around the edge, um, just kind of scuff up, make it feel a little bit more handmade. And for that, I, the brush that I use, I use my concrete brush um, just to kind of get a little bit of wear and tear on the edge. And for that, I actually toned it way down and just kind of did something like this around the edge. Um, and then on top of that, I got the, uh, oh, and then so basically I used the same anchor masking system I talked about before to be like, okay, I want to use the anchor mask to identify these sections. And for that, I was able to create this top circle, which inside the mask here, I'll go ahead and uh, start from the beginning. I used the new um, uh, curve tool inside of Substance to generate this edge. So it's like you can now draw um, a curve on an object. So just to kind of demonstrate that out again, I will just add a uh, another paint on here, grab it as a curve, and now you can see wherever I click on the object will, you know, that that line it'll it'll basically follow that line, and then I can close off the loop that way. All right, so I, I'd use that to get like out of a janky outline, and I, that same concrete brush is applied there. I just filled in the middle by painting it in. Um, and then I, I masked this um, because I wanted to use this in some other capacities. And then I used the anchor points from down below to be like, okay, don't go in that layer and don't go in that layer. Uh, and then in the middle curve, I basically did the same thing, but I started, you know, I started by pulling in uh, the yellow circle mask. I changed the color and then I multiplied in this area be like okay i want i want just the where the blue bar is for that and then for the bottom circle i did the same thing filled uh started with the circle said not that area not that area so you can see i'm, I'm using the layer operations to, to to adjust how i'm utilizing the anchor points down below and that's to get my my general shape and again the cool part about that is, is since it's all anchored together if i change if i start sliding around um, this a little bit, you can see it like it changes everything on the, um, all the way down. So it kind of filters through the system. Um, it makes it exactly how I want. And then those spots are the same spots I used on the teapot. Again, dark color, uh, turn the roughness down and just added a small, small, small bit of height to it. Um, just to get those bumps on there as well. And same thing. Now I just click file, uh, send to send that over into Substance Stager. And when it all gets pieced together, it looks like this. And then for my final render, all I did was I went into my render tab. I changed this, I made the settings ultra because it's just one image and it didn't take that long anyway. 
Um, and then I changed it from the PNG format to a PSD uh, final. And then I made sure to tell it where I wanted to save it. And then I just clicked render. All right, so once that render was done, uh, you're able to take that PSD file and open it directly into Photoshop. And the cool thing again about it is you're given, um, it comes with some additional layers that really, really, really are helpful. Like I can isolate things either by their individual materials or the individual objects. And the thing that's really helpful about that is if you look at the, like just look at the coffee beans. If I want to change the color of all the coffee beans, I could isolate this yellow color and have a mask for all of them. Or I can isolate the individual objects. So if I wanted to, like that coffee beans too dark, I need to lighten it. I can grab that one, which was really helpful. And then um, at the end of the day, I made some uh, final changes and tweaks to it. Like I, I add a little bit of light glow to this. I changed the color of the, the coffee itself. It was looking a little bit too green. I just warmed that up. And you can use whatever Photoshop magic you know and love um, to kind of add on top of this 3D process and create your final image. All right, and that is it. So hopefully uh, that gives you a really good overview of my entire process from start to finish uh, to create this element. And hopefully it gives you some strength and some confidence uh, to do it yourself. If you do, I would love to see your results. Uh, please uh, send them over to me. All my contact information is in the comments down below. Uh, you can also, um, please let me know if you like this video. Like, leave a comment. I, this is a little bit more of a longer form than I normally do. It's a little more casual than I normally do. Um, just trying out some different formats just to see what people like. So let me know if if, uh, if you like this down in the comments below. And again, uh, I will see you next time. I can't wait to see what you create in the meantime. All right, be good, everyone.